We have been looking at the total space groups in the form of a table and this particular table is something which is very useful for cross references, back and forth reference and so on. As we saw that it tells us about the lattice symmetry as well as the uh, symmetry that can be associated with the space group, the point group symmetry. It also tells us about the types of uh, distribution of centric and non-centric uh, systems which can come with the triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic and the other crystal systems. So, we see that in the case of the orthorhombic system all possible lattices are there. So, we, we generate the P lattice, we generate the C lattice, we generate the F as well as the I. Now, all these uh, lattices except the C lattice gets generated in the case of a cube. So, we will have the P, F and I allowed in the case of a cube. The only condition is that the threefold symmetry which is a basic symmetry in a cubic system appears along the 1, 1, 1 direction. In case of the tetragonal system, there is only possibility of uh, primitive as well as the uh, body centered and we see that 4 by m is the one in which we will have the center of symmetry getting in and also in the case of 4 by m mm, mm, center of symmetry space groups get coming. The rest of the symmetry elements, I put a question in the previous uh, discussion that if uh, 2 bar is mirror, then it is non-center symmetric. So, if what is 4 bar? So, 4 bar is also non-center symmetric and that goes into generating space groups phi 4 bar and I 4 bar. So, 4 by m and the 4 by m mm are the ones which generate the, uh, so there are large number of possible non-center symmetric systems in a tetragonal system. And if one looks at the literature and looks at all the magnetic materials, uh, the magnetic materials belong to higher systems, particularly the inorganic based magnetic materials, inorganic material based magnetic materials and many of them are the distorted perovskites and so on. They all go into the tetragonal system and they go into non center symmetric tetragonal systems. So, uh, many of the ferroelectric systems go into tetragonal systems. So, if an organic ferroelectric is crystallizing in a tetragonal system it will be very exciting because such a compound will certainly have a very high uh, hysteresis behavior and so on. So, what I am trying to tell is that the property that comes eventually for the material is already a part and parcel built in due to the symmetry. So, the symmetry now decides what should be the property in a given particular direction in the crystal. So, that way a crystal is not always isotropic. The property in a crystal therefore depends upon in which direction we measure or in which plane perpendicular to which we measure and so on, the property. It also depends upon how the atoms align themselves or arrange themselves in these space groups as we discussed in case of uh, calcium carbonate and CuO. So, th therefore, we have reached a stage where we now consolidate the information which we have on all the space groups before we go further. So, uh, for example, the point group to which the space group belongs is easily obtained from the space group symbol by omitting the lattice symbol and by replacing the screw axis and the glide planes with their corresponding symorphous symmetry elements. What it means to say is for example, if you have a space group like P6522, you delete the P, make 65 into 6 and you get the point group 622. So, that is how we can determine given the space group, we can determine the point group. Given the point group, we can predict what are all the possible space groups, okay. The number of space groups that are possible for a threefold symmetry is 1, 2, 3, 4 if there is only 3 associated with it. In case of 6 by m, 2 by m, 2 by m, we will get so many 4 of them as possible symmetry uh, space groups. For instance, the space group P4, 2 by mmc, P4 by nmc. So, we have taken the case of uh, the uh, tetragonal system. So, if you take phi 4 2 by mmc, it will be actually 4 by m, 2 by m, 2 by m which corresponds to 4 by mmm. 
So, it is very easy to find out therefore, given the space group the uh, corresponding point group symmetry. The other points that have to be noted uh, are the following. See suppose you have a have the Bréviaire lattices with symmetry elements with no translational components. That means, there is no 2 1 screw axis, no glide planes and so on. So, if you look at count the number of such space groups, we have uh, the space groups now corresponding to uh, the total number of 73. So, out of the 230, 73 are called symorphic space groups. The examples are P22, CMM2, F23, etcetera. Notice that the lattice centering is immaterial. What is important is the non translational symmetry operation with respect to, to the uh, uh, point group operation. So, the point group operation should not have the, the, the point group should not be now accompanied by translational components like the screw axis and the glide planes. But as far as the um, lattice nature is concerned, we can have all the possible lattices. So, if we count all of them out of the 230, we get 73 of them and these are called symorphic space groups. Apart from that in the 230 space groups, there are some 11 of them which are quite interesting space groups. These are called enantiomorphous space. It is like the right hand and the left hand pairs. Uh, for example, if you take P31, the 3 1 axis in the case of 3 1, the, the, the translations are 1 third, 2 third and full to get the P31 operation. For the P32 operation, it is 2 third and then it is 1 third in the next unit cell which can be brought back to the previous unit cell. So, the handedness if the first one is considered right handed the second one will be left handed. So, that is why they are referred to as enantiomorphous pairs. So, we have these many space groups which are enantiomorphous pairs and what happens in these case of enantiomorphous pairs is very interesting when we deal with optically active uh, molecules. So, when optically active molecules crystallize uh, the, uh, the let us say they are two isomers, uh, the first isomer which we will call as positive can crystallize in one of the enantiomorphous space group, then the opposite number will crystallize in the other case. We still do not know whether to identify the plus with the clockwise rotation or minus with the anticlockwise rotation, but that is something we will be able to determine by making use of a technique uh, which is very, very specially uh, associated with X-ray diffraction and that technique is known as anomalous dispersion. I do not know whether we will have time to cover that aspect in this uh, course. It is very advanced uh, uh, methodology, but maybe we will mention it in the passing towards the later part of the class. So, therefore, it is there possible by X-ray diffraction therefore, to determine the, uh, the absolute configuration. See this, this is uh, if the plus isomer is in one form and the minus isomer in the other form, in principle, we are now looking at the absolute configuration of the given material, whether it is levorotatory or dextrorotatory, or whether it is R or S molecule. And we can also point out this is R molecule and this is S molecule if we do anomalous dispersion. And that is how uh, it, that technique becomes extremely useful, particularly in case of uh, uh, compounds which can crystallize both in R and S forms. The isolation of R and S by crystallization methodology can be accounted for. Biological molecules, these are also very exciting because there are more and more accumulation of very large molecules. People are now looking at protein-protein interactions, people are looking at protein-steroid interactions and so on. So, these molecules are enantiomorphous. It does not mean that they will go only into these 11 enantiomorphous pairs. They will of course go into only uh, crystals, uh, crystal systems and space groups which have no inversion centers or mirror planes. There are 65 of them. So, out of the 230, when you do the structures of biological molecules, particularly the naturally occurring native proteins and so on, there are only 65 space groups that are allowed. <coughs> so, these are points that one has to remember with respect to 230 space groups. Now, we will go to an area which takes us to the definition of what is a crystal. 
you may be wondering we have been discussing what is a crystal so far and now I am saying again what is a crystal. The reason why we again go back and ask a question like this is to see that we have seven crystal systems. They are decided by the nature of A, B and C and the interaxial angles. We have also said that there are atoms inside this. The point group symmetry and the space group symmetry will tell us how many atoms are there inside this unit cell for example. So, there may be depending upon the restrictions we put on each of these crystal systems the number of molecules inside the unit cell will change. We can have one type of molecule, we can have two types of molecules, we can have n types of molecules in a triclinic system still with z is equal to 1. That means the entire assembly of all these molecules need not have any symmetry. Still the crystal may crystallize in a triclinic system and therefore it is a crystal. So, if you want to determine the structure of it we have to determine the positions of every one of those atoms. So, in a monoclinic system there is a minimum two fold symmetry. We can have any number of molecules, any number of atoms, any number of different kinds of molecules, different kinds of atoms. So, that is what is meant by a crystal. The crystal now consists of the distribution of atoms and when we talk about distribution of atoms we talk about actually the way in which electron density distributes itself to various atom sites. So, now comes the very idea of an atom. An atom we always identify with respect to a sphere that means in the sphere we put certain amount of you know we have the nucleus, we have the electrons surrounding it and so on. But essentially we characterize it by the number of electrons which it carries, the system carries and that is done in terms of what we call as atomic number. In the, in the from the chemistry point of view we have a periodic table and in the periodic table we have various elements carrying so many of these uh, atomic numbers. So, H equals 1, hydrogen has 1 atomic number, oxygen has 8 and so on. That means, so many such, so many electrons are associated with this atom. So, as the number of atoms increase, the atoms become more and more dense. The volume of the atom is uh, something which is determined based upon the nature of the nucleus and the surrounding electron density which goes around it. If we look at an isolated atom, but in a crystal we do not have an isolated atom, we have connected atoms and these atoms therefore are bonded to each other. So, that means there is a certain amount of electron density which goes from the atom to the next atom, the atom the electron density is shared. There is a lot of theory which has been developed over the years which talks about these bonding features. It defines various kinds of bonds and therefore the density is shared between these atoms. But for our practical purpose of uh, looking at the structural determination and also eventually as you will see when we do X-ray diffraction, we are going to assume that these atoms are like billiard balls. They cannot be deformed. So, when we have a carbon we associate 6 electrons with a carbon, 8 electrons with a with a uh, oxygen and so on and with hydrogen there is only one electron. We also know that these electrons are bound to the nucleus. So, we, we have a central nucleus and the atoms are bound to that except for the case of hydrogen there is no core. We call that as the core. The electrons that are distributed are distributed in various levels and we know by atomic theory how these electrons get distributed into various shells. We have the K shell, we have the L shell, we have the M shell, we have the N shell and so on. So, these atoms therefore go and sit inside this box in wherever they feel like depending upon the nature of bonding and the symmetry that controls where they should sit. We have so far seen the symmetry that controls where they should sit with respect to uh, the space groups. We have say, the 230 ways in which the atoms can arrange themselves. But it, do, it does not tell us what kind of atoms can arrange in what way and since we have a choice of very many atoms in the periodic table more than 100 and the way in which they can bond to each other is also different from each other. For example, we have the ionic species <coughs> which can form ionic bonds, we have covalent bonds, we have metallic bonds, we have different kinds of bonds. So, all these can occur inside the crystal and that, that is the one which gives the property of that material and therefore, we have to see how these electron density is distributed inside the, inside the box. So, effectively we have to take the box and dissect the box. 
we have to cut the box into different sizes and different shapes or whatever and then look at the individual pieces. So effectively if you want to see what is the inside a box, suppose you get a present, you know Christmas is going on now, so suppose you get a Christmas present which is in a box, what you do? You open the box, open the box, remove all the packing material and eventually you find the object which you want to find. Now can we open a crystal and see like that? Obviously not and if, can we see the atoms? We cannot see atoms because the atoms are of the size which will not allow us to use this light with which we see things. We can see only objects which are of certain dimensions and it so atoms, uh, ha happens that atoms do not fall into these dimensions. They are much, 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 much smaller. Say for example, we can see an elephant very easily but we may not see an, a, an ant moving on the surface of the back of the elephant because that is very, very small. So we can use a lens and uh, go to the near the elephant and then we look at the back of the elephant and focus the lens so that we will see the ant on the back of the elephant. So in order to see objects therefore we need lens. Now this lens is the one which uh, makes large objects to be small objects to become large. So uh, in, in laboratory for example one uses microscopes. So you can use a microscope to see what is there inside the crystal. Now if you use a microscope to see what is there in the crystal, again the microscope uses light. Now the crystals are of the dimension of an angstrom and so we were, should be able to see what we want to see in the dimension of an angstrom, not in the dimension of 5000 odd angstroms which the light is made up of. As you all know that we have the wave particle duality. We initially in the case of uh, Newton's Newtonian laws, we study the light as though it is made up of particles and then the wave theory brings in the quantum mechanics where we study this in terms as waves. So uh, we then talk about matter waves and things like that. So it is not the intention of bringing in quantum mechanical aspects here except to say that if we want to see the atom, we should use a probe because we cannot just cut the crystal and destroy it. We do not want to have the crystal destroyed but still determine the structure of the molecule inside the crystal. So if you want to do that we need a probe. Now whenever we want to probe something we need a lens as I already mentioned and in order to use the lens we need the light. So what is the light which corresponds to the size of an atom? If we look at the electromagnetic spectrum and examine the electromagnetic spectrum carefully, the light which can be of the uh, one angstrom size corresponds to X-rays. So X-rays therefore are the, the radiation which have the wavelength of nearly one angstrom. It could be 10 angstroms or something like that, in the range of 1 to 100 angstroms or in the range of 0.5 to 100 angstroms. So uh, one can use therefore the X radiation in order to see what is there inside. So we send the X radiation into the crystal. Now when we send the X radiation into the crystal, the uh, X radiation are coming from a rarer medium and entering a denser medium. And then they are emerging out again back into the rarer medium. Okay, so there is a little bit of physics which we have to learn here in order to understand the process. And that process is the fact uh, that process is called scattering. So we send in the light, it happens in light scattering, we will study the way in which light scattering occurs and the way in which the scattering can be reconstructed into the image of the object inside. So these examples will tell us that we need a probe and therefore in this particular uh, next set of uh, lectures we will look at X-rays as the probes which will look into the inside the crystal. When they look inside the crystal, for example, let us say we had the power or the vision of X-rays. Suppose I have a X-ray vision, okay. Then I can see inside the crystal and if I see inside the crystal, I will see the individual atoms. I will see how they are connected to the various molecules. I will see the presence of symmetry and I will see how the 2-1 screw axis is relating one molecule to the other if there is a 2-1 screw axis inside. So we have to therefore also determine the symmetry information. So we not only have to determine what scattering is coming out and so on, we also need to understand the symmetry that is contained inside the crystal. 
So, to understand what is there contained inside the crystal, we need the diffraction experiment done. We I am using the words like scattering diffraction very freely today, but all these will have to be defined in a proper physics manner, so that we know the physics behind the whole thing. And that will form the next few lectures as we come along. So, what we do today is that we have the seven crystal systems. So, how do we look into the seven crystal systems? One of the ways to look into the seven crystal systems is to do the job of a surgeon. So, if there is a surgical blade which can cut the crystal to atomic sizes, then we can cut the crystal and see where the atoms are and then find out which atom is uh, what. For example, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, bromine. So, if we have a surgical knife which will allow for us to cut at one angstrom level, then we can take the crystal and cut it. So, what I will do is towards the end of this uh, uh, section, I will bring in the discussion on how we can cut it. One of the easiest ways in which to understand that is to see the loaf of a bread. So, you have a bread loaf here and this bread loaf uh, uh, which, which you normally buy in a, a bakery. Uh, you see that you have the unit cell here, you start from this as the origin. You have a A direction, you have a B direction and you have the inside C direction. So, it is a three dimensional box. It is in fact, if the, the bread you buy in the, in the shops is orthorhombic. Uh, sometimes it is tetragonal also, but most often than not it is orthorhombic because somehow orthorhombic is the one which has attracted the attention of many uh, bakers in earlier days. I do not know why, but it is orthorhombic. Uh, it can have different shapes as I have shown here. It can have a shape like this. It does not matter which shape uh, the uh, bread slice is. So, we have therefore, a unit cell and now we say this is 0, 0, 0. Then this will be uh, one unit along A direction. So, this will be the position of the coordinate 1, 0, 0. Then we have 0, 0, 1 and uh, 1, 1, 0, all three, I mean the x, y and z, z directions. We can also now take the diagonal along this direction and we will see now that that direction is 1, 1, 1. So, in the uh, next set of discussions, we will discuss how the crystallographic planes come up and how the crystallographic directions come up. So, what we see here in the case of a loaf of bread is that the loaf of bread is one unit here. Suppose I cut this at half the position, you know you can slice it whichever way you want. Uh, you can slice it along the 1, 1, 1 direction, then you will get a nice triangular piece. If you cut it along this direction, you will get pieces along the A direction. If you cut it like that, you will get it along the B direction and if you cut it the third direction, you will get the C direction. So, if you cut it along the A direction and take the central piece, it will be half the distance of A. So, the the coordinate of this point is 0, 0, 0. The coordinate of this point is 1, 0, 0. The coordinate of the half point is half 0, 0. So, now let us say we cut this piece and take it out. Then that particular piece will represent a plane because it is a three dimensional object. We take this plane out, your uh, bread slices which are like this here, which is shown here in this slide, are individual planes. So, they are, they are a two dimensional object. So, this two dimensional plane at half the position, we call it as 2, 0, 0. At one third position, we can call it as 3, 0, 0 and so on. So, these values of 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0 now are given to the planes. So, when we say that we are looking at a 2, 0, 0 plane, that means we are looking at a plane which is at half distance along A and that slice which comes out with uh, B and C values being 0 and we call it as uh, 2, 0, 0. This is also called the Miller indices. We will look at it in more detail uh, when we discuss further on the way in which we can now cut the unit cell. So, when we say we cut the unit cell, in principle we are now trying to see, take out the individual planes and see what is there inside that individual plane. And if atoms and molecules and so on are distributed inside this unit cell, therefore, when we do this cutting operation and look at that particular slice, we should be able to see what is there in that slice. It could be a part of an atom, it could be an atom itself or it could be several other parts of different atoms. So, how are we going to see it? 
Uh, that is something which will now excite our curiosity and we will keep this curiosity in mind until the next class. I want to show you one more thing. This is just uh, something which is very patriotic to me. Uh, this is, this is, what do you think this is? You all think that this is the uh, slice which has been taken out and placed on the plane of the projection because you, you may see this is let us say the, the so called 200 plane. In fact, if uh, that it is possible that it is a 200 plane and wherever the atoms and molecules are, you will see these, these openings and holes and things like that. If you go to a Iyengar bakery for example and buy a special bread, the special bread will have all these additives. He will add uh, cashew, he will add uh, badam, he will add uh, this um, raisins and so on. The way he makes the uh, bread loaf is actually he makes the dough and when he makes the dough he mixes all these ingredients. Let us consider these badam, then cashew and things like that as possible atoms, different kinds of atoms depending upon whether we are adding badam or cashew or some other ingredient, different kinds of things can be added. And now when we mix the dough he does not know where they are and then he puts it into the bakery and bakes this into the oven and bakes the bread. When the bread comes out, we do not know where these pieces have gone. And when we cut this slice, it may so happen we may cut a piece of uh, cashew, we may cut a piece of badam and things like that. So this if you consider as the 200 plane, the half point and spread it round like this, then you see that these holes are the places where let us say badam and cashew and other things are there. So parts of atoms, it is not the full atom. Parts of atoms can be associated with this. Now can we just look at it like this and see whether we can determine the structure? A big question mark. It may not be possible because we do not know how many electrons are still associated with these little pieces. That only will tell us the nature of the atom. So what is in fact necessary therefore is to study all the planes and all the contents of the planes, put them together, integrate them and see what comes out. Now before we conclude for the, uh, this particular session, I will also tell you that this is not the picture of the slice of bread. This is in fact the first picture taken by our lunar probe sent by ISRO. So it so happens that I have some contacts with ISRO people and one of them sent me this first picture which was taken uh, when our probe was about to crash land on the moon. So this is at a certain reasonably large distance from the moon, but you see this is the moon surface. Very interesting, the moon surface and the piece of bread loaf, bread slice, they look alike. What is important is that these holes and the way in which it is jagged shows the peaks and the valleys which are present on the surface of the moon. So this is in fact the picture surface of the moon taken from a closer distance from our lunar probe. I think we will uh, close this at this moment, okay?